look at pedigrees. So a pedigree is, well, it's a number of things. It's a useful way of tracking characteristics in families. So it is a means to track traits in families, and we'll just say in groups of related individuals, okay? So it can be any group of related individuals. You can do an immediate family, you can do an extended family. The other place we hear the term pedigree, and it's a slightly different meaning, though it's very closely related, is when we're talking about something like livestock, or dog breeding, or snake breeding, or um, it's, it's huge if you have anything to do with dairy cattle or beef cattle. Um, your cattle, like if you've got a bull who's got an awesome pedigree and his daughters produce lots of milk or lots of offspring or whatever, his semen is incredibly valuable. So you document that pedigree. You document his ancestors. You document um, who he's fathered. And that makes it even more valuable because you can point to evidence and say, hey, this guy is good. Look at his offspring. He's got great genetics. So that's the other, the other place that we hear the term pedigree, is looking at a record of somebody's ancestors and their progeny, their offspring. But the way we're going to use it here, it's, it's a visual diagram of that same idea. It's a diagram, a visual image of a group of related individuals. So the basics, and these are on the worksheet, but the basics are that squares are males. So square is a male, and a circle is a female, okay? We only have two options because we're only dealing with biological sex here. Now, for every pedigree, when we're doing pedigrees like this, we are looking at some trait, some characteristic, often a disease. So within that framework... We color in the square for an affected male, and we color in the circle for an affected female, okay? And one of the things they do on the OGT, it's not terribly common, I think, outside of that, but they actually will show a half-colored... That's a carrier. That's a carrier, right. Um, we, that's not used in most other places. Um, that I know of, but um, it is it is used in some places. <clears throat> so those are those are your basic symbols. When we have a square and a circle that are joined by a line between them like that, that means they reproduced, um, or it means a, or it means a marriage. Um, offspring come down off that line. So that would be a couple who have had a daughter. Okay, It's a couple with a single offspring. We have special symbols for twins, um, for identical and non-identical. And we also, I've tried to, um, over the years when I've done this project, I've tried to expand it to include more and more situations that students see when we have pedigrees. Because I very often ask students to do a pedigree. So um, twins look like one of two things. If we have identical twins, they come off a stem like that. Okay? So the, the line, the stem drops down and then splits, indicating that they're sharing all their DNA, they were one egg. If we have non-identical twins, they sprout directly from that line. And that shows that they're no more related than any other siblings. So this could be... Now, it's not always a boy and a girl, but it could be a boy and a girl. So there's a family with five kids and two sets of twins. They have a set of identical twin boys, a set of non-identical, a boy and a girl set, and then a single daughter on the tail end of the thing. In general, we put the siblings in chronologically starting from left, moving to right. So these twins would be the oldest of the kids, and this girl would be the baby of the family. Okay? So that's fairly standard. 
Um, some other things. How many of you in your family or in a family you know has there been a remarriage and there are siblings who only share one parent? Many. So what do we do if this parent remarries? Either one of them. Here, let's um, shrink this. Um, so if, if one or other, the other of these parents reproduces with somebody else, we draw another line off to the other side. Okay? And, you know, depending on how many kids there are, these lines get pretty long and these pedigrees can get pretty confusing. Let me actually make this a longer line because there I didn't leave myself room to give them offspring. So if she remarries or produces an offspring with another partner, there, she had a daughter by someone else. You know, and maybe he also has another family. Maybe he had a daughter and a son with somebody else. So it, it can get fairly confusing. One other scenario um, that commonly comes up, so these, these would be half-siblings. These are siblings who share one parent and where those parents have reproduced. Um, you know, maybe this was a first marriage and his wife died. We typically put a single line through an individual to represent that they're deceased. Um, so this would be... deceased. Um, maybe that other partner is still living. Just because they got divorced or they're no longer together or they're not reproducing together anymore, we don't have to do anything with this line. Okay? Because these lines, we, we very often say it represents marriage, but really in a pedigree, we don't care who's married to who, legally or otherwise. We really only care about who's reproducing with who. So this is kind of outside the bounds of, you know, well, these two weren't married, but they had a child together. doesn't matter. It looks the same as a couple who's married and has a child together, okay, for the pedigree purposes. So the fact that these two reproduced together and had all these kids, we don't have to change that line to say, oh, now she's reproducing with him and she had another child. doesn't matter to us because we're just looking at the genetics. What about the case of adoption? So what if these two, let's, we're going to have to copy this and move it to the other page because we have definitely run out of room here. So, what if these two, here and here, adopt a child? How do we show an adopted child here? So we're worried about the genetics of the situation, but we also want to represent family groups. So what we typically do, if they adopted a son, is we would show that son with a dashed line connecting him to the family that he is part of, let's do that better, we would show with him with a dashed line. So what that dashed line says is this is not a biological connection, but he is part of this family. And then what we would show up here if we know anything about them is we would typically show a line off to the side with the biological parents. Um, so for individuals who are adopted, this becomes a little bit complicated because there are both genetic um, conditions that you can inherit from your biological parents, but there are also conditions that can arise as a result of your environment. If everybody in your family is being affected by something and there's no known genetic link, we want to know what household you're living in. We want to know what conditions you're subject to. Now that's outside of our genetics that we're doing here, but it, it is useful in some cases when we're looking at disease, in, disease patterns in families. Um, okay. So that covers adoption, death, remarriage, reproduction by multiple partners. Um, what else can we cover here? How about multiple generations? So um, pedigrees tend to get, they can get really, really big. Um, and there are two basic approaches to take. Um, the more common one that we tend to see is with the, the first generations. So these would be the oldest generations at the top, working their way down. So here we might have a set of grandparents and another set of grandparents. And maybe these folks have, we'll throw in bunches of twins. There we go. Um, a singleton and a pair of identical twin girls. And these have, let's say they have two boys and a girl, all separate births. Okay. Um, if these two reproduce 
and this guy reproduces. What relationship? Okay, we'll finish up after lunch. The challenges we were starting to do this is also keeping those generations straight. Um, you can, though it's not common, I sometimes do if I'm doing one just for my own purposes, I draw a line so that I know, oh hey, this is the second generation, this is the first generation, this is my third generation. And you can, I mean, you can extend these pedigrees into multiple, multiple generations. So let me ask you this, what is the relationship between this individual and this individual? Um, what is it? They, have, say they share grandparents, which makes them cousins. So those two are first cousins. Um, his mother is a sister to her father. They share a set of grandparents. They are cousins. Okay, so now let's look at how we use these pedigrees to trace diseases, disorders, conditions, traits. I mean, this could be something like, would it, okay, everybody, I want you to look at one another, pull your hair all the way back off your heads. Widow's peak. Do you know what a widow's peak is? Now, I know you can't pull your hair very far, Zach and David, but Zach, I think you actually have a widow's peak. David? No, I can't see it. Um, so do you know what a widow's peak is? A widow's peak is a way that your hair grows. Here, we'll do our, our sort of generic person. And there's your hair pattern. People who have a widow's peak, the hair grows down in the center a little bit. So the hairline actually drops down, and that's called a widow's peak. You guys are really bad at playing along. Yes, sir? Okay, so we have a characteristic here. Widow's peak, which is dominant, and a straight hairline, which is recessive. So if we use the alleles um, big H and little h, what two genotypes are possible for somebody who has a widow's peak? They could be big H, little h, or what? It could be big H, big H. Okay, Either one of those genotypes is going to get you the phenotype of having a widow's peak. So if you have a straight hairline, we know that you are little h, little h. You are double recessive. So let's look at our pedigree here. And let's say that the characteristic we're tracing is widow's peak. So let's say we have a dad with a widow's peak, a mom without. Um, these two are identical, so if one of them has it, the other will automatically have it. And let's say that this mom has it and this son has it. And this daughter has it. Okay, so these are all people who have widow's peaks. Now, what we need to know or what we would like to know is um, we, we know this trait is dominant. Does that, what does that tell us about, oh, actually, let's do this. How much can we figure out about a parent's genotype from their offspring's phenotype? Whoa. Okay, so for this individual, what are the possible genotypes that she could have? We just said it. Yeah. She could either be big H, little h, or big H, big H. We don't know. What do we know about her father? We know that her father had to be little h, little h. Does that tell us what her genotype is? Yes. So if we know her mother, again, her mother could have been big H, big H, or big H, little h. But we know that her father was little h, little h. So if we look at a dad who is little h, little h, with any combination of 
Well, actually, no. It also tells us we get a lot of information here. And you know this is notes, right? Okay. So if the mother was big H, big H, how many of their offspring could possibly have a straight hairline? Look at the Punnett square. None. So if mom was big H, big H, they wouldn't have this guy with a straight hairline. He couldn't have a straight hairline. So based on that, we know that mom must have a recessive gene. She must be carrying a hidden recessive. So we've now figured out her parents' genotypes because we know that she has a widow's peak. Do we know what her genotype is now? Could she possibly be big H, big H? No, because we know that her dad passed a small h on to her. So we have just figured out three genotypes, all from phenotypic information. Okay. We know that brother has this genotype. We know that sister has this genotype. We've got mom, we've got dad. Um, what about this parent? This one up here, that mom. Can we figure out her genotype immediately? How many of you think you immediately can figure out her genotype? One. Okay, here's a question I want you to ask yourself. Does she have any offspring who don't have a widow's peak? Yeah. So we know that the options for her were, oops, big H, big H, big H, little H. If she have offspring that have a straight hairline, what must she have passed on to them? A little H. So we know that she has to be heterozygous. She can't be homozygous. If she did, every single one of their kids would have a widow's peak. Okay? So this is, it's, it's a great way to look at family characteristics and trace a pattern and figure out what people's genotypes are. This is the kind of thing that's used real heavily with genetic counseling. When you finally get your genetic counseling exercises, which now should be tomorrow, um, you're going to actually be doing four, no, two different pedigrees. So you're going to get a case history from a family, and based on that case history, you're going to write a pedigree for a couple. Yes, sir. Okay. So one, one easy way to tell if something is dominant or recessive. Look at all of the possible genotypes for an individual and look at their offspring. So here we know that this is a dominant trait. We know that the possible genotypes for this dad, for instance, are big H, big H, or big H, little h. Well, all of his offspring have widow's peaks. Does that tell us that he is definitely homozygous? No, but it starts to make us suspect. If we look at this lady and we know it's big H, big H, or big H, little h, and we look at her offspring and there are some who don't, that tells us it's heterozygous. If this was a recessive trait, let's actually do one for a recessive trait. Okay, so looking at this, and we don't know what this trait is. How can you tell if something is recessive automatically? What, what, uh, well, not necessarily just less of it. Can you carry a gene for a recessive condition and not have the condition yourself? Yes. So for any recessive condition, you can often find parents who are not affected with the condition, but who have offspring who are. So if we're saying that this is big N, little n, what do we know automatically about both of these individuals? They're both carriers. We know automatically they're carrying a recessive gene. So that's big N, little n, that's big N, little n. Now, you know, luck of the draw would say that a quarter of their kids would be affected. Does that mean you can have 10 kids and they're all affected? Yeah, it does. Just luck of the draw. Just like you could have 10 kids and they'd all be boys or they'd all be girls. You know, the... the uh, outcome of every pregnancy does not influence the odds of the next pregnancy. So something like that, it's 
that's definitely recessive when we look at it. When we look at something like this, what we start to see is a pattern where you never see an offspring who is affected who doesn't have at least one parent who's affected. Okay, So you do tend to see more of it, but that's not the only clue that you get. You never ever see an offspring who has a condition that one of their parents doesn't share. Because if they got that gene from somebody, the somebody they got that gene from is affected if it's a dominant condition. Okay, You can't carry a gene for a dominant condition. Um, having the gene means you have the condition. Whether it's widow's peak or green eyes or you know whatever the condition is. It could be red hair. Um, it doesn't have to be a disease or a disorder. But um, there are some autosomal dominant disorders when we, when we get the genetic counseling projects tomorrow. Um, we'll talk about autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. Okay, let's do one more, and I want to see if you can quickly identify what it means. Okay, what do you notice about this? It's the first thing you notice. Okay, the grandparents, nobody's affected in the grandparent generation. So in generation one, we have no affected individuals. What else do you notice? Well, there are actually three, but what else do you notice? What do you notice about the affected individual? They're all males. They are all males. Now, you've got parents who are not affected who have kids who are affected. So what does that tell you first off? Is this a dominant or recessive condition? It's got to be recessive. Now, the fact that it's all males who are affected, does that, so we, we've, we've identified that number one, this is a recessive condition. I can't spell recessive today, sorry. The fact that it's all males, could that be luck of the draw? Yeah. It could, but... Do we start to wonder if maybe this is what? Sex-linked. X-linked, specifically. Is this something that's being carried on X chromosomes? So, like color blindness. <coughs> so, to test that hypothesis, what we can do is this. Well, if this was X-linked, we would know that this mother would be X big N, X little n. She'd have an affected X. We would know that this guy would be X, whoops, X little n, Y. This guy would be X little n, Y. Since this female has an affected son, what would her genotype have to be if this is sex linked? she would have to be a carrier. She'd have to be X big N, X little N. Is that reasonable so far? Yeah. Typically when we start to see a condition where we're only seeing one sex affected, if we've got three generations, multiple individuals affected, and they're all male, this is probably a sex-linked condition. Okay. The minute you see uh, a mix of males and females who are affected, you can pretty much rule that out. Um, could we have a case where we had an X-linked condition that a female was affected by? Yeah. Yeah, but it would be incredibly rare. So let's show, let me show you how that, what would have to happen for that to occur. So we're going to erase this brother for a moment. I'll redraw him out here. Because we want to give this guy room to meet a lovely person who he's going to reproduce with. Okay. So if he reproduces with her, and we don't know anything about her family, and they have an affected daughter. Whoa. If she is X big N, X little N, she's a carrier. And he's X little n, Y. You could actually have a daughter who is X little n, X little n. Okay, so it's rare, but it's possible. Um, and basically, if you're, and I, I know I've said this before, I don't have any colorblind guys in here, right? I think this is the first time I've ever taught biology where I did not have a colorblind male. Um, it's unusual.
you have a fairly, I mean, it's 6% of males. So out of 100 guys, you would expect that 6% of them would be colorblind. So out of 50 guys, you would expect that three of them would be colorblind. So out of 25 guys, which is your average classroom, statistically, we would expect that one and a half of them would be colorblind. Okay, it means typically I get one in every class. <laughs> um, we don't have half guys. So anyway, um, it's possible, but it's unlikely for an, a, an X-length condition to affect a female. Okay, with what we've done here, you should be able to correctly complete this. I will treat this as a quiz grade. So I'm going to grade the Punnett squares. I will treat this as a quiz grade. Um, if you need to make changes or corrections to it, since we've now done this work together, you can. Um, so this is a, just a worksheet, but I'm going to treat it as an assessment grade, which will help some of you. Um, that's it. Those are due tomorrow.